All right, so it is my pleasure now to pass the mic to our guest speaker here. Um, so Marianne Cabanillas, CEO of United Healthcare Community and States, South Texas Health Plan. Excuse me, I need to get some more water. <laughs> All right, so Marianne uh, Cabanillas serves as the president of United Healthcare Community and States, South Texas Health Plan. She is responsible for leading initiatives that result in growth through strategic relationships and innovation. Cabanillas leads teams that are responsible for provider, member, community, and employee engagement. She joined United Healthcare in 2004 and has over 20 years of experience in the healthcare industry. She has worked in both the public and private sector with an emphasis on public health care and government products such as Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP. Her prior roles include President of Health Plan Operations, Vice President of Marketing and Network Development, and Director of Contracting. Uh, Linda will be joining her in conversation today, and I'm going to pass the mic to both of you all. Enjoy. Thank you, Mariela. Hi, Maria. Nice meeting you. This is Likewise. Linda. With our... Hi. Hola. Hi. Hello. And Marianne, uh, nice talking to you. And to start this uh, conversation, we want to know more about you. Marianne, let's start by having you tell us a bit more about yourself. Where are you based? And give us an insight into your career journey. Thank you, Linda. It's a pl uh, pleasure to be here with you all today. Saludos. It's um, a joy to have this opportunity to, to meet with you all. So I, will, I would love to share a little bit about myself. Um, as I said, I was, you know, they said in the introduction, my name is Marianne Cabanillas. I'm a proud Latina. Um, I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I moved to Texas when I was three years old. Um, however, my parents um, always made it a point to ensure that our roots were uh, front and center in our lives. Um, so in our home, our primary language always spoken was Spanish. In fact, I was fined 25 cents for every word that I would say in English. Um, because my parents wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we um, were tied to our language. Um, and I will say that in full disclosure, most months I owed my parents a lot of money at the end of the month. Um, but we, um, we also made a point of making sure that we kept our Latina traditions. Um, for example, you know, at Christmas, we would always celebrate Three Kings Day instead of Christmas, you know, so much. And so I've always felt extremely connected to my culture. Um, when I graduated from, from college, I actually moved back to Puerto Rico. And I say, I always say I got my first real job in Puerto Rico. I actually started my career in healthcare working in a call center for an insurance company. Company. And about one week later, I got promoted to the manager of the department, which was really interesting. I had just graduated from college and I had no experience whatsoever. Um, but the funny thing is, is that um, it was really more just because they I was the only person that was able and willing to do it. Um, and so it was a very interesting learning experience. Talk about being thrown into the deep end. Um, and so I um, I, I really enjoyed that experience and I actually stayed in Puerto Rico with that company for about four years until they transferred me back to Texas to start up a new health plan, um, which actually really led me down the path or the journey that I'm on now, um, you know, being the CEO for the, uh, the um, Texas health plan. But I um, I eventually made my way to United Healthcare, and you know, like like was mentioned, I've been here since 2004, so I've been here for about 17 years. I've been here a while. Um, I started here as an associate director, and I worked my way up into the CEO role. Um, I'm still based in Texas. I live in Houston, um, but I do spend a lot of time in Puerto Rico. In fact, I'm coming to you today from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, so I think that if I were going to um, sum up just one. My, my career journey in a few words, I think the words I would probably use are patience and persistence. Um, it's been a slow and steady progression for me, um, but honestly, I've I've had to push really hard, um, you know, to and be persistent to create the opportunities for development and growth that I've had. So they didn't just come easily, um, and I think that's probably uh, similar to many people's journey, especially I think for minorities and for women um, more so than um, than other individuals. So that that's just a little bit about my background. Well, 
it's an amazing background. It's impressive. And I love to, to hear about all these stories because you're a successful woman, a successful Latina. And this is why you're here representing all our voices. By the way, I am from Honduras and I am based in, in Spain. So this oh. is how all Latinas all over the world. And this is what That's you're amazing. saying. It, it's yes. probably pretty late for you then, is, or is it early? Wait, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a little late. Um, it's late, it, right? Seven hours. Uh, it's so. 10, 10 p.m. But but I love That's what I figured. I love having this conversation. Okay, so please, Marina, um, Marianne, sorry. Can you tell us more about your work at United Healthcare? Sure. Your position there and your experience as a CEO. That's amazing. Sure. Please Absolutely. tell us. Absolutely. So yeah, so my role at United, you know, as the CEO for the South Texas Health Plan, uh, in this role, I'm responsible for our Medicaid long-term care products. Um, so that's uh, usually it, the, the programs that I manage generate about $4 billion in, in revenue annually. So it's a pretty big chunk of change um, that I'm responsible for. Um, my team consists of over a thousand employees, a very diverse group of people. Um, one of the things that I'm most passionate about in the work that I do is really addressing issues of healthcare and disparities in the communities that I serve. Um, and the I will tell you that I think that the part of my job that I'm most proud of, um, but that's also the most challenging, um, actually isn't any of what I just described to you. Um, the part that I think is that I'm most proud of is the last two years I've been leading our National Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council on a national basis. Um, and I'm also the executive sponsor for our global employee resource group um, called Unidos. And honestly, that's probably been the most fulfilling part of my work, but also the most difficult, right? Um, it's been a journey for me to really learn. And I've learned so much um, around about different cultures, different individuals, and, you know, just how important representation is. Um, so, you know, I think that that's um, the most interesting thing that I do. Obviously, I have to take care of my day job so that I get to do that other really cool, fun work. Um, but yeah, so that, that's just a little bit about the work that I do at United. Well, uh, I must say thank you. Thank you because you're representing thousands and, and I can say millions, okay, of Latin that needs representation, needs people to, to elevate their voices to say, hey, Latin people, we are here and we're here to give you our best. So thank you, Marion, for that representation. Thank you because you're heading a four billion company, a four billion revenue company. And this is a proud Latina, okay? So thank you for that. As a well, Latina, I appreciate it. Thank also, you. we want to know, uh, we want to know also more about what social determinants of health, SDOH means and how it impacts underrepresented communities. You know, this is such important work around the social determinants of health. And I'm going to take a step back and just explain what that is first for anyone who doesn't really work in the healthcare space so that you understand what it means. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the importance to, you know, underrepresented communities. So first of all, let me just say social determinants of health basically are the conditions in your environment or in your life um, that people or where people live, right? That affect a wide range of health and quality of life issues or outcomes. So there's basically five different social determinants of health when we talk about that. So these are the things that are not necessarily health care related, but that impact our health on a larger basis, right? So obviously health care and access to health care is really important. That's one. Um, and, you know, that, that, that would be the first one that I point to. Um, the second one is around economic stability. Um, the third is education, access to education. The fourth being um, your neighborhood and the environment that you're in. And then last but not least, um, your, the social environment or your community that surrounds you. So I'm going to back up and talk about each of those in a little more detail about how those impact underrepresented, underrepresented communities. 
So if you think about healthcare and access to healthcare, right? Um, and I'm gonna talk just about the United States because that's obviously where I am, but um, many people in the United States don't get the healthcare services that they need. Actually about one in 10 people in the United States don't have access to health insurance. And it's actually um, worse. Those numbers are much worse in minority communities and it's including in the Latino community. Um, and so people without insurance are less likely to have access to primary care, which means that they're usually not able to afford getting healthcare services or medications. And so one of the things that, you know, that we have to focus on for underrepresented communities in the, is making sure that we can increase access to healthcare for them to make sure that they um, have access to preventive care services and, and ultimately are able to treat chronic illnesses earlier, um, because that's a huge uh, indicator of whether or not you're going to have a long, healthy life, frankly. Um, the second one is around economic stability. So again, in the United States, about one in 10 people live in poverty. And many people can't afford basic things like healthy food, healthcare, housing. And what we know is that people that have steady employment are less likely, obviously, to live in poverty. But if you're less likely to live in poverty, you're also more likely to be healthy. Um, but the problem is, is that many people have trouble finding and keeping a job. And, and if you think about like people with disabilities or you know certain conditions, it's even worse. And so, um, so of course, this is an area that you know that we have to focus on um, for our, the communities that we serve because not having a job or having uh, living in poverty is a pretty big indicator of having uh, poor healthcare outcomes. The third one is around education and access to education. And we also know that people with higher levels of education live healthier and longer lives. And so children who don't, um, who come from low-income families tend to um, experience or struggle with things like learning how to read and you know understanding how to do math. And so they're also less likely to graduate from high school and again, likelier to have um, poverty in the future, which means that they may have problems in the future around their health care. Um, we've actually seen a correlation between people having safe, high paying jobs and issues like heart disease, diabetes and depression. So again, you know, it's not necessarily directly tied to health care, but these things impact your health care outcomes. The fourth one is around your neighborhood or your environment that you live in. And we know that people who live in areas with high rates of violence or unsafe drinking water, um, unsafe air, they're obviously going to end up with higher healthcare issues or more healthcare issues. And unfortunately, many racial and ethnic minorities um, tend to live in places that are not healthy or not safe. Um, so those are, you know, the, uh, the examples around the neighborhood and the environment. But then last but not least, I want to talk about your community, right? Because the fifth one, the fifth area around social determinants of health is the community that you live in. And what we know is that people's relationships and their interactions with um, in friends, family, coworkers, people in the community can have a major impact on your health because you've got that social support or that community support. And that really impacts your health and well being. And sometimes it's your emotional well being that's impacted. So those, in, those relationships are really important and they have a, a big impact on our healthcare as well. So that's really what the social determinants of health are about. That's what that means. And at United Healthcare, um, we do a lot of work around these five areas. Um, you know, we are, some examples are that we focus on economic stability, making sure that we've got, we've got a team of people on our staff that focus on helping people find meaningful work if they want to, you know, get back into the job field. Um, you know, we've got a team of school liaisons that help parents work through the school system to ensure that there's equity for their children. Um, we, around, ed, you know, um, neighborhoods and environment, we've got a housing team that helps people who are homeless find uh, permanent housing that's affordable. Um, and then last but not least, we partner with a lot of community entities um, to help ensure that we're wrapping around our members and making sure that they've got that community support. So that's a little of the work that we do at United to make sure that we're helping with that, that those shortfalls in those areas that ultimately will lead to impacts in healthcare. Yes, and you said something very important there that you're helping, you're improving, and you're mitigating all these 
um, social determinants. You named five, and they are all very important in their about their where they live, uh, their income. So all of this determines their, their their health. This is very important to know, and for us as well that. Um, we can apply this to our personal life. We need to mitigate these five uh, things that Marion just mentioned in our own life. So we can apply this to ourselves. And you see a company is applying this to mitigate uh, their, their healthcare unit and we can do that for ourselves as well. Um, Marianne, please tell us more about how United Healthcare Health equity initiatives uh, are erasing the societal divide and make healthcare more accessible. And we have a little questions around that. Uh, I'm going to just let them all around. Uh, what are some changes in implementing these initiatives and how United Healthcare is leading this initiative? Again, so how they are working with their equity initiatives, erasing, erasing the societal uh, divide and make healthcare more accessible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, here's what I'll tell you, Linda, is that, you know, we were just talking about some of the things that we do at United, right? Um, you know, to make sure that we're breaking down barriers for individuals, but I think it's a lot more than that, right? As we discussed, individual health is deeply impacted by external factors. It's not just, you know, the genetics that you're born with or the life decisions that you make. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that little things like education can make a huge impact on your success, um, you know, on a personal level, but also your health. And so one way that we work to reduce health disparities is by really um, providing philanthropic philanthropic partnerships that address specific communities or disparities that we that we've identified right so for example um, you know this year we've provided about nine million dollars in philanthropic partnerships to address localized maternal health disparities in states like Nevada New York Ohio Texas Washington DC those are areas where there's real challenges Texas has um, got some really disproportionate numbers around maternal health when it comes maternal and fetal health um, in our state. And so we've really tried to target certain initiatives like that. Um, we've really done a lot of work in, you know, trying to eliminate those health disparities by helping to fund initiatives that eliminate some of those. But one of the things that I'm actually most proud of is some work that we've been doing internally. And the reason that this is really important, right, is that first of all, we want to make sure that we're part of the solution when it comes to um, health dis breaking down health disparities. And as you can imagine, as a healthcare company, United actually employs thousands of clinicians, including nurses and physicians. In fact, United Healthcare is the largest employer of nurses just behind the, the Veterans Administration, the VA, um, in the United States. So it's really important that we ensure that our clinicians are part of are, are not part of the problem, right? And that we're helping to break down health, health inequities. So for that reason, we decided to take a look at ourselves, look internally. Um, and what we did is that we um, started we embarked on this journey where we really started to train all of our clinicians on unconscious bias and the impact of their bias on decisions that they're making and how that could be impacting the healthcare decisions that they're making for our members. And if you think about the huge impact that that can make, right, because of course unconscious bias means by definition it's something you're not aware of. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey for our clinical teams um, because we can we can have a really big impact um, on somebody's health care just with the decisions that we're making for them. Um, I don't know if you read about some of the literature that's out there, but there's research that shows that when you think about like physicians, for example, right, um, a physician may make a decision around what kind of medication you're prescribed based on their own internal bias around a certain ethnic group. And so what we know is that certain minorities maybe don't receive pain medication to deal with like post-surgery post situations, right? 
or they don't receive as, um, enough medication to help them overcome uh, the challenges that they're having from a pain perspective, post-surgical procedures, because of, inter because of unconscious bias that a physician may have about a certain racial group or an ethnic group. And so if you think about that for a minute, right, that's massive. That's just one little example. But it's really important for us to make sure that at United Healthcare, we are part of the solution to breaking down those, um, those biases. That, well, that's shocking. Actually, uh, uh, I'm speechless because this is something really new for me. I'm just if I'm shocked, I cannot imagine the people that we're not in the healthcare. Um, yeah, we're not into in inside that community, inside there. We don't know. We don't know this. We we don't know that by bias the medicine are changed. And well, uh, uh, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Thank you for sharing about that because that's uh, valuable information. And this. Thank you for um, advocating uh, for belonging there, here, and the unconscious bias and training all of your decisions there to just have equity. That's what we're looking for. And uh, yeah, and that will make this will sound like this will sound like a, a beauty pageant, but this can bring world peace, you know? Yeah, it can make a huge difference. You know, I mean, if you yeah, think about make the fact that, you know, we we touch so many millions and millions of people at United Healthcare, uh, you know, and we've got thousands and thousands of clinicians that work here, um, you know, so taking this on is a huge initiative for us, but it is probably the most meaningful work that we do. Yeah, yes, definitely. And this brings uh, us to the next question. And about this topic, is it is related, okay? What does the Latin community, the Latin and Hispanic community in United Healthcare looks like? Yeah. Okay. Who yeah. are the people that are behind all of these initiatives? You and your team. Uh, how many of of your how? Yeah, the team. Who are the Latins behind this? Yeah. So you know. I, I will tell you, I think that we've got a really active um, Latino community within United. Um, I, as I said earlier, I'm the, um, the executive sponsor for our employee resource group. We call it UNIVO, of course, United UNIVO. Um, and so employee resource groups, I think, are really critical because they really foment growth by offering formal as well as informal development and leadership opportunities and creating visibility for employees um, via networking and things of that nature, right? So, um, you know, our, our Unidos community at United is very, very active. We have monthly cafecito meetings where we just get together to network and talk with each other. Um, but here's, here's what I will tell you though, because I don't want to paint it as like everything is just peachy and perfect. The reality is, is that we have a lot of Latinos in our organization. A lot. The reality is, is that as you look at the leadership of our organization, those numbers decrease drastically. And it's not a criticism of, of at United. It's just a reality, um, you know, in terms of sometimes the glass or concrete ceiling, um, however you want to call it, right, that, that we live with. Um, so as Latinos, it's really important for us to keep pushing forward and making sure that we're closing those gaps because um, that those opportunities don't always come as readily to us. And the other thing is, is that when you are a Latina who is in a position of power, like myself, right, making sure that you are part of the solution to help close and narrow those gaps. Um, so making sure that we're giving opportunities to people. I mentor a lot of people in my organization. Um, you know, I, I work really closely with all of these employee resource groups to make sure that I am part of the solution because I feel an immense sense of pressure um, to do that. Uh, I think that, you know, there, there aren't many of us, but our voices need to be loud so that we can make sure that we continue to close those gaps. And Latinas, we're loud, you know? Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. We all know. I'll admit it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marianne. Uh, we have another question here that's around 
your challenges when you were facing your early career stage as Latin, your junior professional experience as a Latin. Can you share more about the challenges you faced and now that you're a leader? Can you talk about that, please? So here's what I will tell you. And I tell this story often and I always get a really like uh, reaction, right? People kind of go, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. But, you know, um, I've had experiences where I had a former boss who um, I was actually asked to speak at a, to present at a leadership forum that we do. And there were only, only the top 1% of our uh, leaders in the organization actually get invited, right? And I was asked to attend and not just to attend, but to present. And I was so proud of that opportunity as a Latina. I was the only Latina that was invited to participate in that. And I was really proud of that moment. And I remember my boss right before I went on stage said to me, he goes, you know, the only reason that you were picked to present is because you're Latina, right? And it shocked me and it made me question everything, right? Like, why am I here? What am I doing here? Are they just utilizing me to, you know, check a box or like, what, what is this, right? Um, but what I realized as I reflected on that over time and actually even in the moment, what I realized was that that was really his issue, not mine. If that was his perception, um, that's his perception and that's okay. And I don't care why I was invited to speak. I'm going to make sure that I nail it and that I represent my community well. Right. And so I just kind of like, you know, pick myself up and put myself in that, change my perspective on it and said, okay, even if that is true, which I'm not sure I believe, but even if that is true, um, then let's take advantage of this opportunity and let's make sure that we hit a home run here, right? So that's really, you know, the, um, the way that I've approached my career. I've had, that's just one example. I've had many instances of being made to feel or tried to make people where they tried to make me feel lesser than, um, you know, or make me feel like being Latina is what's given me opportunities. And again, like I said, I, whatever, right? Brush that off and move on. Because as I was younger in my career, I would overthink all of that. And, and, it, and it made me really anxious. And I just decided at some point that it was like not worth it to even, you know, um, to even feed into that commentary. When you ask about some of the challenges today, what I will share is that I feel an immense sense of pressure to represent my Latina community and to cast a positive light on our community. There are too many examples in the media and out there, you know, of, you know, very negative perceptions of Latinos. And I feel like it's very important. I feel, like I said, an immense sense of pressure to make sure that I am, you know, representing our community well and that I'm always thinking about how I'm being perceived so that I can continue to push forward the image of Latinos in the community. I think we need to be proud and remind people of our heritage. Oftentimes, like me, I, I don't have an accent. Accent. And so oftentimes it's easy for people to forget that I'm Latina, but I can't let anyone forget. I constantly am reminding people about my background and my heritage because of that need to make sure that we are well represented. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for it's joining. And uh, nice meeting you. And we keep, uh, we keep tuned. Mariel, I'm just giving the mic, the mic to you. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Bye. so much. Gracias a, a las dos por la conversación, por los consejos, por la fuerza. Absolutely. Knowledge is power. That's right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank okay. You. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank you. Thank wow. You.